starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Economic Development Webinar Series. My name is Susan Lowe. I'm with the Design Coordination and Outreach Branch of the Ministry of Jobs, Trade and Technology. I'll be providing technical support for today's webinar and moderating questions and answers. I'm located in Victoria, BC on the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen people, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. And I'm joined today by Christy Fairholm Mater of Scale Collaborative, who's also here in Victoria. Before we go any further, I'll just review some housekeeping items. Here's your control panel. This lets you interact with us on the webinar. The orange arrow at the top lets you shrink the panel to the side of the screen. It will automatically shrink if you haven't done anything for a while, but you can just touch the arrow and it'll come back. Um, the orange microphone shows you that you're muted. Uh, the blue box lets you expand the entire webinar interface to the entire screen that you have. And the little hand <clears throat> Let's you raise your hand to show you want to speak. However, because there's many of you and few of us on the webinar, uh, we likely won't be using the raise hands function on today's webinar. We will, however, be actively using the enter a question for staff box. And there will be a couple ways that we use that. You'll see them coming up. Uh, finally, you have two options for connecting to the audio for today uh, via your computer over voice over internet or by phoning in. So if you're having challenges with your computer connection, you can click on the little phone call button uh, circle and it'll give you a phone number to call in with an access code for this webinar and a personal identification number that is unique to you so we can still see who you are on the call and that helps us track uh, questions and answers as well. Uh, if you're joining us via the Instant Join web app, it looks a little bit different and your audio settings are behind the little gear icon. So if you're looking for those, that's where they are. Uh, so today, uh, the first thing we want to ask you is what are you hoping to learn from this webinar on social enterprises? Um, I'm going to gather up some of your uh, responses as they come in, but we can also share this uh, with Christy along with your contact info. So if there's anything we don't address on today's webinar and you have burning questions, then one of us can follow up with you and, and make sure that we connect you with the resources that you need. So um, there's that ask a question of staff box, and I'll just go over a few more things. So if there's something specific that you really want out of today's webinar, then ask that in there, and uh, we'll try to cover that during the session. A few more things before we carry on. Yes, today's session is being recorded. Um, so the GoToWebinar platform, it records the audio feed and the slides that are shared on the screen, but not our webcams. Uh, so any questions that you type into the question box are saved as part of the, uh, the record and um, questions for you afterwards uh, and follow up if anything is needed. The presentation slides will be made available as well. It takes me about a week to get all of this together, assuming all of the technical details worked out. And uh, we'll find, you will find it all under the BC Ideas Exchange uh, webinar series link on the economic development part of the BC government website, uh, which you probably accessed at some point to get onto this webinar. Okay, uh, one more thing before we carry on. Uh, we have extended the local economic development in BC survey. The deadline is now this Friday. Uh, we know that there is a municipal election going on and many people are quite busy right now. So we wanted to give people an extra week to share their knowledge with us. Uh, the survey asks questions about how economic development is done in your community. So what structures does it have? Um, do you have strategic plans in place? Do you have performance measurement systems in place? Um, how you're dealing with workforce issues, a variety of different questions that we here at the ministry would like to ask you so that we can better design programs, tools, and resources that respond to your needs. Uh, so um, it's in your best interest to give us that information that we need so that we can design those programs and services that will help you. All righty. So um, onwards to our presentation. So social enterprises, and there will be more than just social enterprises in here. We're going to talk about social procurement and social finance as well with Christy fairholm from Scale Collaborative. Um, sort of the framing question is, uh, what is a social enterprise and what are the conditions of success for a social enterprise? 
So Christy, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and then I'll change the uh, presenter screens over to you and you can take it away. Why don't you introduce okay. yourself first before trying to um, manage the technology. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that sounds great. Thanks, Susan, and thanks for inviting me to speak today. So my name is Christy Fairholme Mater. I've been in the nonprofit sector uh, my entire professional career. I started as a youth worker and then began to do economic development work, local economic development work in towns like Squamish and Whitehorse and um, up in Vernon and, and so on. And after a while, I began to get more and more interested in social enterprise. I worked for the Canadian Mental Health Association in early 2000s developing social enterprises that employed people with significant and serious mental illness as well as small business supports. Uh, I then worked for another organization uh, in a different kind of social enterprise role where we were looking at how we increase financial security for people with disabilities and, and worked in, in that social enterprise role for a while, moved to Victoria in 2011 and uh, began to look at the Vancouver Island ecosystem around social enterprise and what did exist and what didn't exist um, and engaged in a number of initiatives where we're mapping and looking at the supports to build the capacity of social enterprises to help them grow, to start, to launch um, and to raise awareness around what social enterprises need in order to be successful. And I've done that through a number of, of collaborative initiatives um, such as the Vancouver Island Social Innovation Zone, Social Enterprise Catalyst, and some other initiatives that we're working on that are about to be announced. So a lot of background around developing, running, research, um, and, and figuring out how to, how to make more of this good thing happen. Cool, all right, I will change the presenter controls over to you. There we go, and we can see your screen and your presentation. Okay, can you see? All successful? Yes, okay. good. Okay, so when I moved to Victoria, I started an organization called Scale Collaborative alongside two other people who have operated in social enterprises. And we really focused on two areas of, of interest. And one is to work with nonprofit organizations to become more diversified financially in order to um, increase their, their impact and their scale. And a lot of nonprofit organizations are been grant dependent or rely heavily on grants and funding. And that financial pie is getting smaller. It's becoming more unstable. It's changing. Donations are changing. And the, what we see is there isn't enough revenues that come from that kind of funding model to actually meet the needs that many nonprofits are working towards. So we began to look at how do we help nonprofits to financially diversify in a number of different ways. And social enterprise is one of them. So we've worked with around 40 nonprofits in the past three years to help them developing their financial diversification strategies and then connect to their impact and to their scale. And then the other part that we work on is to build socially enterprising ecosystems that incorporate social enterprise and how to build capacity with social enterprise how to find investment for social enterprise and funding and grants is still an important part, but there's other types of investment that we think can be brought into play more to help social enterprises grow and nonprofits to diversify. And then social procurement. So increasing the demand for, um, for enterprises that meet community needs. So there's a lot of these concepts that are around at the moment. We hear about social innovation, social entrepreneurship, social enterprise, social procurement, social finance, and these are the things that are circling around tools that can create positive social change in communities. So, you know, social innovations, those new and disruptive ideas that tackle what we call as complex or wicked problems in a community in a new way or in a, in a systems way is not always a new idea, but how do we take ideas that work and put them into the system so we can create greater change. And social entrepreneurship is, is often you know, innovative and change focused, but not always market based. So you can see lots of nonprofits or social entrepreneurs that do really neat and impactful work. And it's not always those selling a good or service in the market. And that's where we see social enterprises. Social enterprises specifically sell a product or a service to a market and receive funds for it. So that's, that's the difference between a social entrepreneurship and social enterprise. And then social procurement, it's around leveraging and generating demand using those procurement dollars that are already being spent and beginning to layer different value into those procurement dollars and creating, you know, being able to create a market for enterprises that can meet and, and provide that value. 
And then social finance is, is providing the funds that can invest in that kind of impact. So I'm going to talk specifically today around a community-based social enterprise ecosystem. And it's more complex than this, obviously, but the three areas I'm going to focus on are social enterprise, providing blended returns and community benefit through market-based businesses, social finance, so having that social enterprise and social finance they really need each other, right? So social finance is looking for things to invest in, social enterprise is looking for investors so they can start and grow. And then over on the left side, it's around social procurement. So being able to increase demand for these businesses that provide multiple blended returns. And the way that I have the presentation set out is we'll go through each of these in a pretty quick 10 to 15 minute, we'll stop, have any questions around social enterprise, and then we'll come back, I'll do a review of what social finance is, any questions, and then a review about social procurement, any questions. So, and just to qualify, I do a lot of work in the ecosystem. But some of these tools are very technical and, and complex. So social finance is very complex. Social procurement is very complex. Procurement, the whole field into itself. Each of these have their whole field and professionals behind each of them. And so my expertise is really around social enterprise and then that ecosystem look. So if you have specific questions around how does social finance work, how does social procurement work, then Susan and I have talked about some people that can come and maybe present further and bring that capacity and knowledge to, um, to all of you. Okay, so we'll start with social enterprises and these are the little engines that can and do. What is a social enterprise? So social enterprises tend to operate in community they are innovative in trying to find ways to address problems in their community through a business model. They are market-based, like I, I mentioned. They do earn their revenues by selling a product or a service. They have a mission baked into the DNA of that business. So that, that's the reason for the business to operate is because it's achieving a greater mission. And for social enterprises, many of them, especially those in the nonprofit sphere, is that their profits are directed back into the enterprise and to grow the enterprise or back into the mission or the impact of what they're trying to do. So the profits are not being fed out to external investors, right? So it's, it's making sure that that length of the profits going into, into community or into furthering the enterprise or into increasing the impact. And I think that there's a social enterprise has been around for a very, very long time. You know, we think about YWCA, they run in hotel in downtown Vancouver. They've been running that hotel for a very long time and it generates revenues, it provides a place to live, but it generates revenues for the core operations of the YWCA. That's an old, old social enterprise. And so nonprofit organizations and community businesses have been around for a long time. But as I alluded to earlier, there's a bit of a sea change that's happening. So nonprofits in our country consist, you know, they, their economic impact is around 8% of GDP. They're a huge employer. They create you know, incredible value within communities. And we see that their core funding landscape is what has been traditional, their funding landscape, that government funding, their philanthropy, those donations, and their foundation funding, that is not growing. So the needs we see are growing, the complexity of the needs are growing, but the funding is not growing. And not only that, the funding has made a huge shift away from core operating funds into project-based funding. So the funding landscape has become much more insecure and stable. So we have these organizations that are operating, often have community goodwill and create impact in their communities. Their financial model is beginning to change and shift. And we also see some changes around philanthropy and around donations that are also becoming more unstable. So we're seeing that nonprofit organizations are really having to make a, a significant change in their financial and revenue model. And of these, earned income, being able to identify where they can leverage their assets, where they can increase their income is becoming a growth area for them. And so we're seeing this big increased interest and shift into nonprofits beginning to do social enterprises. And I do want to recognize that not all social enterprises are nonprofits. So when we look at the continuum that's here, we really see that pink area is on either side of the nonprofit or for-profit ownership divide. So social enterprises really, you know, they are that nonprofit structure or they are 
businesses that are owned by nonprofits. So we see this increasing a lot is where we have for-profit businesses that are majority owned by nonprofits. These are the kind of models that nonprofits are using. And we also see a real rise in for-profit businesses that are developed for the purpose of creating impact. And they, and they again, that raison d'etre, that reason for existence is to create impact and to increase value. So there's a study that looked at what does social enterprise and social ventures look like across BC. And it was done in 2015 at the Sauter School of Business at UBC. And they recognized that this growth in the social enterprise sector is huge. So it grew 36% in five years. The social enterprise, social ventures create 533 million annually in, in revenues. They map out employment and how many people they employ and so on. But the point I put up in here, which I thought was interesting, is we see that the majority of them are nonprofits. We see about a quarter, I don't know if that's quite a quarter, but maybe 23% of them are for-profit social ventures. Then we see some co-ops. And then finally, because it's pretty new, we see the triple C or the, the C3 incorporation. And that's a bit of, of what they look like in terms of our, our province and, and what's happening. And we also see that that growth when they looked at the projections of the growth is that 36% in five years, we're gonna see that I would, I would anecdotally <laughs> see that that's continuing to grow quite significantly. So let me see if there's anything else about this. So the areas where we see social enterprises really taking place or doing work in tends to be hmm, subsectors. We see arts and entertainment organizations. We see health and social services are getting into social enterprise. We see retail, the wholesale trade, and the fair trade kind of social enterprises, and professional and technical services. And so what is the purpose of the social enterprise? And as I talked about, it is that fake DNA of creating an impact or trying to solve a problem in a community. So some of the ways that we can see is that you know, is it profits that can be redirected? So the purpose of the social enterprise is to make money. That money goes back to fund the core services or services in a nonprofit organization or in a community that are not able to be really funded through a market-based mechanism. So you create one market-based mechanism, mechanism to serve a non-market-based mechanism. So we see that kind of social enterprise. We see social enterprises that are really targeted at employment and trying to find employment opportunities for people who may face barriers to employment and targeting that and that's where we see a lot of social procurement beginning to come around is being able to target employment outcomes um, and social enterprises provide that and there's some great research that's done on how social enterprises are different in the way they create employment to employ people who may face barriers to employment we can see that they're meeting a need in a community or within a sector that's not being met already and sometimes the, those needs might be um, have a market base, but maybe not a profit base. So they can be put on a market model, but um, they they maybe operate better in a in a nor in a nonprofit or a profit redistributed model. And sometimes there's gaps in the market. And so it's good to think about what is the kind of what is the problem that your community has that can be faced that's being faced that could be solved by a social enterprise. Here's some examples of of ones that exist. Um, and sort of divided to the gaps in the market, or are they trying to create a profit? So Skookum Cafe, that's a social enterprise here in, in uh, the CRD, and it's out, I think, in Colwood, and, and they provide training for youth who may have barriers to employment, and not only do they provide training and operate a cafe, but they offer also operate a catering business. So we see Wynn, which is the Woman in Need thrift shop, and thrift shops tend to be they're allowed um, within the CRA rules around social enterprises, so a lot of nonprofits operate them. But when not only uses their thrift shop to, you know, bring in money and to redistribute, you know, uh, waste diversion and so on, but they also use it as an employment and training opportunity for women in the community. Build is a social enterprise in Winnipeg, and what they do is they are employed by Manitoba Housing to do their retrofits and their renovations. And so they use it as an opportunity to train people on how to build construction skills and then put them to work. And the other one here is Umista uh, Museum uh, Cultural Center. And so this is another th kind of thing you'll see is when you see museums or nonprofits will have a gift shop um, or something that generates revenues that then support the museum or support the cultural activity. Up in Courtney Comox, we have a pet treat bakery. 
And this is high-end pet treats that are being created and supporting people with disabilities in the community to have employment. So that's a growing social enterprise that's currently existing. And here's another example. This is the Cowichan Energy Alternatives in Cowichan. And it's a number of different organizations. Uh, they sort of have a co-op. You can see in the back what they've got back there. They've got the biofuel network. They've got the, oh my goodness, the grease cycle, the Cowichan biodiesel, the energy alternatives. And so they are trying to divert, uh, address climate change by diverting and creating biofuels and helping trucks to operate on biofuels. So they have a number of different models and enterprises that they put under that umbrella to, to address a, a climate issue in the community as well as reuse waste oil. So just some examples of different kinds of social enterprises that are around. And there's a lot, I mean, like businesses and like small businesses, wherever you can find a business opportunity, there's also an opportunity for a social enterprise. I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that are faced by social enterprise. And I apologize for all the text that's on here, but sometimes we just want to write, write some things down. So <laughs> here we go. So challenges faced by social enterprises, and I'm going to focus on nonprofit organizations because the nonprofit or charitable organizations are not very well served by existing services for small businesses. So they're quite different from for-profit structures in terms of their governance, their access to finance is really different. The level of accountability that they, they're required, especially by, by funders. Um, their marketing, they have to walk a different kind of line around their marketing and, and making sure that they're, they're, not, they're not putting the profit seeking or that out front, but really looking at that community goodwill and the impact that they're creating. And sometimes those things make it challenging to run, run a business. So, and the social enterprises that I've operated, the financial challenge is not insignificant because, the, again, as I talked about, the funding is, is not enough and it tends to be very slow. So when we're running a business and trying to get something up and going, not having access to capital that is unrestricted uh, to be able to deploy to the needs of the enterprise um, is difficult to come by because it's very difficult to access equity financing. Uh, because we can't pay out shares, and so we end up in debt financing. But that debt financing, you have to start making your payments very quickly, so it puts the, quite a lot of pressure on. So this is where the rise of social finance is really key, and being able to understand financial instruments that can support nonprofit or charitable social enterprises. The other thing is that you might see a very different skill set within nonprofits or charities than a business requires. So that's a shift that we need to make: is to be able to think, well, what am I? What does my business need? What is the skill sets that are required there? And then to be able to hire effectively for those skill sets. So one of the enterprises that I'm working with right now, they're a tech startup. And for a nonprofit to understand the tech world is a huge learning curve. And then to hire the tech skills is another huge learning curve. So we can see that, that some of that mismatch can occur. We see that organizations, when, a, when an organization starts an enterprise, it's quite different than a sole proprietor. For one, they don't have the friends and family funding that goes in. So they're again back to that finance piece. Um, and we see that startup and break even can take longer, but they also, because they have an existing organization that often has quite a significant amount of capacity, they probably have their administration systems all set up. They have, um, they have marketing, they have a leadership, they have community goodwill, they have a brand, they have a lot of stuff already that's a huge asset. And so they can be shielded from early shocks. They can sort of get going and get moving. But it's that making sure that that march towards long-term sustainability uh, it keeps going so that they don't give up at some point, but get over that hump that every entrepreneur gets over to, but it's just a bit of a different timeline. I talked about that limited access to capital um, and that we do see that there's difficulty sometimes in balancing the social mission and the organization culture that currently exists with the business reality. And so that everyone has like a, oh my goodness moment from what I, and see is like you can kind of operate it as a bit of a nonprofit and how it works and then you realize you know we got to get the rubber hits the ground and that when the rubber hits the ground moment is where that shift occurs and they begin to operate it as a business so and there's huge opportunities so we see that social enterprises provide additional revenues that support community needs and fill that market gap as it occurs that it really is enables the drawing upon communities to make something happen, make something really, really interesting and innovative that people get passionate about. And so you have that tapping into community goodwill to support something in that. Social enterprises and nonprofits 
Um, they are economic contributors to communities, and then social enterprises allow to upfront the economic contribution of the sector in a, in a slightly different way, as well as then social enterprises become employers, they become purchasers, they become suppliers in a way that is really recognizes that economic contribution. They can fill gaps in the market in a meaningful way, and, and in some ways that for-profit organizations or enterprises are not able to. So that focus on maybe food security or local food, employment, clean energy, waste management, all of those things can be can be filled by by a social enterprise if it's not something that the for-profit um, enterprise market or uh, businesses are picking up. It's there's a, a really growing network of social entrepreneurs or an ecosystem as I talked about around social enterprises, and so there's some there's tools and supports and training and all of that that's grown up to be able to help social enterprises do this. And that we see that social procurements are creating markets and creating demand that social enterprises are well positioned to fulfill, and that social finance is really looking for places to put their money in and, into, and to invest. So something to think about is what exists in your community to support social enterprise. When you look around, are you, are you providing that enhancement and support to enterprise skills? And what I put here is the six pillars. And so the Social Enterprise Ecosystem Project, which is Social Enterprise Canada, and I've got that on the left here, has identified six pillars of what's required to have social enterprises be successful. And that enhance enterprise skills to ensure access to capital investment, and to expand market opportunities. So those first three are lined up to what I'm going to talk about today, social enterprise. Number two is social finance. And number three is social procurement. And then these other ones is promote and demonstrate value. What's the regulatory framework and networks and community engagement? And if you're interested, you can go to that website, take a look and, and dig down a bit more into what are those eat, those six pillars. And then over here is another great resource as well, which is Indigenous Social Enterprise Resource Bundle. And it's outlines specifically for Indigenous social enterprises, what are the ways to, again, build capacity, access funds, how to start a social enterprise, and a good resource guide. Some of the other resources that you can, can tap into as well, the Social Enterprise Institute is an online platform that is a training and support platform coaching. So they do online training for people who want to start social enterprises and then they can get connected to a coach. And so it's Canada-wide, and that's available. Um, we can see that the so Canadian Social Enterprise Guide has been around for quite a while. It's in its second edition, and that's a, a how-to manual for, again, people who want to start up and, and think about doing social enterprise or growing their social enterprise. We have the Social Venture Institute, which happens in Vancouver and on Hollyhock, and that's a great conference for people who are operating social ventures and social enterprises to come and gain access to network skill capacity Futurepreneur Canada, they, I'm sure people have heard about them before, and they have partnered around definitely helping the young people to think through their business model, to think through creating that business plan, to look at where they can get their financing, and so on. The Social Enterprise Catalyst, we did this on Vancouver Island, and this is a bit of a different model where we gathered community around, we did a pitch event, and we used that opportunity to provide resources, um, to resources, support, capacity, technical assistance, to a number of social enterprises on Vancouver Island. So we used an event model to generate some of that capacity for, for folks. And then Thriving Nonprofits is a program that Scale Collaborative operates, and that's we're working with nonprofit organizations to help them create that financial diversification map and landscape and to match it to their scaling and impact goals. And then from there, if social enterprise is one of the areas they want to diversify their, their revenues from, then they can begin to tap into the other things in communities to help them to do that. So at this point, um, any questions or comments about social enterprise? Thanks, Christy. I'm just going to turn my webcam on again so people can see me. We can chat a bit. Uh, look, I'm on the other side now. How did that happen? Um, I actually have a question for you. Sure. Um, you talked about different uh, building enterprise skills, and um, you know, before joining the government, I worked in the nonprofit sector. I was also an entrepreneur, so I'm curious what you think are the key skill sets of um, a person who's going to run a social enterprise. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there has to be um, a willingness to risk. The willingness to see opportunity and to and as we talk about to love the problem 
Um, so identifying those problems, identifying the greater problem, but also the day-to-day -day problems and being able to, to move, to risk, to challenge, to innovate in those moments and looking forward. So it's an opportunity focus. I would say we talk a lot about entrepreneurial mindset. I think some of the, the key skills is that people really need to know their numbers. They really need to be able to understand finances and be able to do pro formas. They need to be able to understand cash flow and be able to do financial projections. Those pieces are, are really critical. And again, it's a little bit of a different skill set when you're when you are shifting from a nonprofit focused into a running a business, is that the way nonprofits operate their numbers is quite different. You have secured funding, you have to achieve your, your activities and your deliverables within that funding. Um, and you get your funding before you do the activity, whereas this is the, the flip. You have to begin to do your activity before you get the money in the door. Um, and I do think that getting some excellent support and figuring out that marketing strategy and the business model is critical. So right up front, is your, how's your business model working? How does it line up with the financials? And then creating that right marketing mix, that strategy that combines and really puts forward not just what is the benefit um, in terms of the impact, what's the change they're going to achieve, because nonprofits are very good at doing that kind of work. This is what we're doing. This is the difference it makes. But what's the benefit to the customer? And that, again, is a different shift, is looking at that value proposition to customers, not necessarily the impact. And social enterprises need to upfront their value proposition to customers, what the benefit of it, you know, purchasing from them and providing that service or product. And then behind that is, and in addition, it's going to help change the world. Right? So it's beginning to make that shift. Cool. Hey, have you ever used the, um, the business model canvas with social enterprises? Yes, we use the, we always use the business model canvas. <laughs> we use the social impact canvas, oh, okay. which is specific for social enterprises that I like a lot. And that, that gets a bit more around like, what's your impact? What are you doing about it? What's your, what's your revenue model? But then it's the same thing. Who's your customer? You know, why would they pay for you? What's the value? All of that breakdown that's used in a business model canvas is, is really critical. Cool. All right. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have a question that has come in. Um, what is your experience with social enterprises in more rural areas? Any good examples other than thrift shops, which most communities have? Um, are you including cooperatives in the discussion? Yeah, I think co-ops are, are part of when we looked at that. That pie chart, co-ops are part of that social venture, social enterprise landscape, for sure. And I mean, the examples that I gave, both Couchin and and um, the Pet Treat Bakery are both in rural communities. And so we see that different social enterprises exist all over the province in different ways. So Prince George has some, Trail has, like every community kind of has their social enterprises and they operate around. So I guess my question would be is, what do you see in your, in your community? The ones that I... We did a scan, and you can look on Hubcap BC, which is a which is a, a BC government site. And when we did the Vancouver Island Social Innovation Zone, we actually scanned and looked at all the different social enterprises on Vancouver Island, and we counted them and looked at what they did, what sector industry are they operating in, um, and we talked to them. And we looked at around uh, 200 social enterprises on Vancouver Island. So you can go onto Hubcap, and you can see what exists around on the island great most of them are are rural yeah there's a lot of um cooperatives and uh some community forest models might actually be run as cooperatives and that is an yeah. example of a social enterprise so. yeah all right i know you have more for us so i will okay. here we go so social finance social finance the way i thought about is you know we have the little engine that could and social finance helps the little engines get over the mountain so it is approach to managing money and investing money that begins to have that blended model return. So we saw social enterprises have a blended model return, right? They provide impact returns as well as financial returns. And so that's what social finance is looking for in impact investing is to get that financial return and that impact return. And there's a whole bunch of different types of social finance models. There's community investing, micro lending, sustainable and business social enterprise lending. So there's grant making and program related investments all fall under. The umbrella of social finance. There's another continuum. So you can see on this side we have the financial impact and on this side we have the social impact and the impact investing is really looking at that blended return and so they tend to impact and want to look and invest in socially responsive businesses, 
social purpose businesses. You know, there's all these different names for <laughs> all these different types of businesses. Uh, Co-ops is someone wants to do enterprising nonprofits, right? So those organizations that are finding ways to create revenue streams, and then an on-mission enterprising arm of a charity. So again, that social enterprise continuum is what social finance is looking at investing in. So if you look at what's happening, we see that social impact investing is growing. So there's becoming more and more interest of a shift of trying to invest these type of dollars into these kind of enterprises. So, and it's growing quite exponentially. And so right now in Canada, there's $9.22 billion of what's considered impact investment assets looking for places to invest. So if we look at the breakdown of what happened in 2010, is that you can see what type of impact investing, where they're beginning to impact or, or where the money is being held. So, and who is creating that investing? So we see foundations are investing, credit unions we know, you know, international impact investments, so these are the kind of funds that are looking to invest. And you can say community loan funds as well are in there. And we're seeing a bit of a rise now in 20, well, 2018 now, um, we're seeing a rise of community investment funds. And I'll talk a little bit about that. In one scan that I looked at, it seems like the biggest challenge that impact investors or social finance investors are looking for is a shortage of high quality investment opportunities with a track record. So that seemed to be the biggest challenge that they were finding is they couldn't find or they're looking for enterprises to invest in to put their money. And at the same time, we're hearing from social enterprises, social ventures, is that they're, they're not able to find investors that want to invest in their impact businesses. So there seems to be a perceived or real, I'm going to say gap that exists currently. Money that's looking to invest, enterprises that are looking for investment. And so I'm not really sure quite what that gap is. I have some theories about it, but I'm not sure quite what that gap is, but that seems to do exist. So I think then it's, it's looking at, so what does your community provide? Like how does your community provide opportunities for that social finance investment? If you have social enterprises and social ventures taking place and starting up in your community or trying to grow in your community, is there opportunities or ways that you can identify them for social finance invest, investors and, and as well as help them find those funds? So here's a couple of places that they can begin to find and identify funds. So there's a, a resource called the Impact Money Finder. It was developed by Van City and, a, and the Spring Accelerator. And you can go onto it and it identifies you can type in sort of what type of social enterprise, what type of money you're looking for, and then it will sort through and find different types of, of investment funds that are available all the way along the continuum from what we call sort of like, in, I'd say venture philanthropy, that kind of grants that are willing to invest in enterprises, all the way to different types of, of investment funds. It, one of the challenges with the Impact Money Finder that I found is that you're not able to, to sort it according to community or to region. So it's, you can sort it according to industry or to impact level, but we're not an impact area, but not according to region. So sometimes it looks like there's a lot more. It's more abundant than what really exists on the landscape currently. This is another thing that happens. It's called SVX, and SVX is a place that's trying to match those gaps. So it's trying to identify, here's a good social, social venture investment. Here is a place to begin to match investors into that. You can go and you can see if you're an investor and you want to invest in something or you're an entrepreneur and you're looking for funds and you can sign up and they begin to help put that together. Some other ones that I want to focus on and I would encourage you to go and research each of these to see what they're doing because they're all slightly different. So Rise of Capital is coming out of the Sunshine Post and I'm sure that um, those in Community Futures know about Rise already and they are looking at investing in social enterprises and social ventures that are right in the place where you usually can sort of start up and get going and then there's a bit of a dip where there needs to be an infusion of capital before an enterprise sales and, and revenues begin to increase and so they're looking at investing when I've talked to them about in that area and really providing that early stage capital that's required and I see that they're they're growing and, and looking for more investment opportunities. Uh, Lift Philanthropy Partners, they are a philanthropy organization that looks for organizations that are scaling, wanting to increase their impact, and they bring together ph venture philanthropy to invest in, in those enterprises as they grow. I want to reference again Social Enterprise Catalyst. This was 
it was a capacity building enterprise uh, initiative as well as tried to bring money. So we brought and we raised $40,000 of funds from the community and then we had enterprises come and pitch and then invested in, in those enterprises. And so that's the kind of model that we were able to do without putting too much structure around it. It didn't require us to go through securities or any of that kind of stuff. We just held community-based events and then provided opportunities for community to come together to invest in, in growing social enterprises. So that was, that was um, something we, we did on Vancouver Island. Uh, the Creston and District Community Investment Co-op. So this is providing vehicles so that local community members can invest in local businesses. And it's really, they've done a whole bunch of different work around having RRSP vehicles um, and trying to create, um, you can create an investment pool like the Knives and Forks Co-op does as well, their community investment co-op, where people become members of the co-op, they put up a certain amount of capital, they together decide to invest their funds and provide that capital there. So there's a bunch of different things that are emerging in BC that are, are social finance vehicles. And this is not, this is certainly not the only few, there's, there's a, a bunch of other ones. So again, encourage you to hop on Impact Money Finder and it will give you a good scan of what exists already, what might be available to begin to you know, provide access into your community or some models that might be interesting to look at in terms of wanting to do some of these things in your community. And so I would, if there's an interest, I would highly recommend having one of these organizations come on and talk about what they're doing and how they're doing it. Okay, questions or comments about this? Alrighty. Um, I want to mention also, before we go to questions, there's one more thing that people should know about. If they've been keeping track of the webinar series, we had folks from Invest Local BC, uh, which is a crowdfunding platform for both nonprofits, community projects, and uh, privately owned businesses, uh, and they're up in northern BC, so there's another venue there. Um, question. Some grant agencies, such as gaming grants, will not provide grants for a social enterprise. Is it better to be classified as a nonprofit or a social enterprise for grant purposes? Um, it, I'm going to say it depends. Um, so different funders will will fund enterprising activities, and and lots will not. So that's that gap that we're seeing around social enterprises. I think that what I see happening more is that nonprofits will, if they have, they'll kind of try a social enterprise idea within a nonprofit so they can get a sense of if there's a market, if it's going to work or so on. And then once it begins to gather some steam and begin to move, they put it into a for-profit structure and separate it from a nonprofit so that they can still access grants and funds. They're still fully on side with CRA, um, and, but they're also still able to benefit from the social the social venture and this and the social enterprise going. But it all depends. I mean incorporation and governance and structure is an important conversation. Um, but, the, but you can do quite a lot of social enterprise and, and business activity within a nonprofit or a charitable structure. There just becomes a point where it it may or may not fit there anymore and then it needs to have this other solution. Does that answer the question? Yeah I think so. So in my okay in my experience working at a nonprofit that had revenues coming in that weren't charitable is you had to be very clear about um, how the revenue I had that was coming in was still mission focused and uh, and that was specifically um, covering that and answering questions from the gaming branch when looking at that uh, that funding source but that is only one funding source and there are many others and I think what Christy has shown here today is um, thinking it's the enterprise skills of how best to finance our organization uh, is where you have to start thinking outside of the box and um, imagining yourself as more than a nonprofit or a nonprofit plus a, a, an adjacent entity. Yeah, related, like nonprofits can run, can earn revenues and they can run related businesses. All of that is permitted and allowed. So it's when it, when it shifts to being viewed as being profit seeking or outside of the mission of the organization, that then there needs there's some questions and chance to, to think about um, if it's within the right governance structure. So earning nonprofits can earn revenues absolutely, and lots of them do. Um, it's whether or not it's creating a separate enterprise that may or may not align with the nonprofit structure, with the nonprofit's mission that it's that it's operating. 
great. All right, well, I know that we okay. have exciting stuff, so let's carry on. Okay, social procurement, carrying on with my train analogy here. Social procurement, I see is that, that lane more track, so um, creating the pathway that, that creates more of this, this good thing. So we know that where you spend your money matters. As individuals, we make lots of choices around our, how we spend our money and more and more people spend their money in a way that also integrates impact. So we can see that you know buy local is a really important thing. And we know that when we buy locally, that we support local jobs in our communities. So that's that idea of spending where you spend your money matters. And so that same premise is looking at where institutions spend their money also matters. And that we see that organizations or, or institutions can use their procurement to begin to also make an impact in their community, to use their procurement dollars to increase their local economic impact, to begin to address some of the social issues that they may face in their community and to increase community well-being. And by social is a organization that is beginning to certify and brand purchasers and suppliers who are committed to creating impact. So why do we, why social procurement? So social procurement is more than a financial transaction. It's allowing procurement to be more than a financial transaction, but also to become a tool for building those healthy communities. And like I said, creating some of those, those closed links of being able to just layer value within, within procurement dollars as well. And we see that it is purchaser value combined with supplier value combined with social value is where we see that community value. So we have that value of the good or service to the procurement, the dollar value to the supplier. So that's beginning to create that economic benefit, that social value that's created by the purchase, whether it's local economic value, whether it's you know local food systems, whether it's employment, whatever it is that they want to layer, the, the purchaser wants to layer within that procurement opportunity and we begin to see that community value. So there's been an evolution of procurement. So for a long time, it was you know, price and quality. And the lowest, lowest price with the quality is, is what gets the contract. And then we began to see um, in, you know, the, towards the end of last century, I guess, is that they began to say, okay, well, why don't we have price and quality, but also have a potential for it to not hurt our environment. So there began to be a layering of green objectives within those procurements. And then now we see this addition, the emerging trend is to be like, we want price, we want quality, we want to make sure that we're not hurting the environment with what we're doing. But also there's a potential to use this procurement dollar to create social value. So that's the trend that where we are now, and we're seeing this, this rise across Canada. We see that federal government's beginning to look at, at procurements and looking at their procurement and how they derive social value from their procurement. We see the BC government beginning to think about this. We have the municipalities on Vancouver Island are taking big steps towards valuing and looking at that layering of different value within their procurement. So last year we did a, a scan of where social procurement looks like for Vancouver Island. And we identified that there is around $300 million of annual spend that could add different kinds of value. So you can see the organizations that we looked at is that some of them were integrating and working to apply social procurement to all their different kind of revenue expenditures or relevant expenditures that they have. There were some that were looking at targeting specific areas of spend. So sometimes they'll say, you know, we'll have social procurement be integrated into our catering contracts. So they'll begin to look at that kind of spend. We'll make sure that everything has local food or has a percentage of local food, that kind of thing. We see people beginning organizations that are looking at engaging in a pilot, pilot and what they were doing, and then some that were just exploring. So from all of that, of when we went and talked to a variety of municipalities and big institutional purchasers and identified what was the overall annual spend that procurement makes on Vancouver Island each year, out of that, what specifically could be targeted by layering social value. And what we found is, is that the $300 million was nice, that was great. Um, it creates a, a significant demand, but also that the areas where social procurement gets most likely blended in or integrated in is around food services, inf information technology, construction, employment facilities, and maintenance. And that seems to be where those kind of procurement choices are ones that are currently seeing uh, social procurement value being layered in there. 
And we see that most of the common social benefit when we looked at the suppliers on the supplier side, the most common social ben benefit that's provided by contractors and by suppliers is employment and training opportunities for people who may face barriers to employment, such as young people or indigenous populations, people with disabilities, so areas that community identified there was maybe underemployment. Um, and that not very many procurement managers reported that they have directly purchased services or goods from a social enterprise. More frequently is that we see social enterprises beginning to provide you know, secondary or, or third value. So you might have a big contractor, a construction company that's gonna bid on an infrastructure project and they spend their, their catering dollars on employment. So they begin to find ways to integrate, um, um, integrate uh, employment opportunities in, but then would partner with a social enterprise like Embers who does, who does construction temp work to begin to provide that employment opportunity or that avenue into that into that um, construction opportunity and, and increase employment. So we see some some things like that is where we see those not only some opportunities for direct bidding but also partnership opportunities that begin to integrate you know different types of organizations. So and Vancouver Island is home to about 40 local it's home to 40 local regional governments. It has 138 hospitals and long-term care facilities. It has three large credit unions. It has five post-secondary institutions, it has foundations, and so on. So these together create quite a landscape for social procurement. We see some interesting things happening. So I'm going to just focus on BC, and you can look at the slide later and see what they're doing. But these are different areas that are integrating social procurement into here. So we have the BC social purchasing guidelines that are coming through the government. We have BC Housing is looking at social, procur social purchasing and how they begin to provide employment opportunities potentially to their residents through, um, through their purchasing and their procurement. Um, we see the Community Benefit Hub, which is coming out on Vancouver Island, across the island, that begins to support municipalities to integrate social procurement into their spend. And so to begin to think about how to do procurement, begin to look at that organizational assessment. How do you build a healthy community? What is your community need? What do you purchase? What are the barriers for implementation? How to evaluate the suppliers? And what steps can you take going forward? So pretty standard moving through to identify how this could be a fit for your community to begin to link it to some of the community needs and especially economic development or employment needs and food needs and so on. So what's happening in your community around social procurement? As I mentioned earlier, the Social Enterprise Ecosystem Project, they, they are doing the six pillars. In there they have the Social Enterprise Institute, which I mentioned earlier. They have a whole social procurement training, online training piece that's happening there. We also have Buy Social Canada, and Buy Social Canada has toolkits. It has scorecards. It's been able, it has a big outline on how to begin to implement social procurement and what that could look like. And for those on Vancouver Island, the Community Benefit Hub will also become a real resource to be able to not only connect to those resources and tools, but also then connect to coaches and consultants to help work with people who are in charge of procurement to integrate procurement into uh, social value into those procurement dollars and then to identify those suppliers. And this is really key in terms of the social enterprise ecosystem is because we can see that this is going to create market opportunities for social enterprises to fulfill patching that to enhancing those enterprises skills so more social enterprises can be ready to bid on these kind of contracts and integrate this kind of value. And then that piece of connecting to those local social finance vehicles to invest into this opportunity. Questions, comments? I'm watching the time and seeing that it's getting a little, a little tight. Yes, we're getting close to the time. Uh, I do have a question and it's, I mean, we, we have a municipal election going along and I'm pretty sure most of the people on this call are not uh, currently running for office. I might be wrong. I don't recognize all of the names, but a lot of people here are in the economic development community. Um, and I guess my question is, what do you think that people can do um, to get social procurement on the agenda and and start making the case uh, for leadership in in sort of creating a willingness in the community to do that. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that it's really important to to demonstrate the value 
and the business case. We can begin to talk about procurement dollars that get spent on companies and corporations that are not then contributing back into community. And when we start talking about local economies, being able to use the taxpayer dollars, being able to use that procurement spend to then add value to community begins to have a really strong business case to it. So I think that there's beginning to just let people know what's there, let them know that this is the trend that's happening, that this is where we're seeing leadership. This leadership's coming down from all different levels of government and that this is an opportunity for them to also, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, the world is changing and we want to change ahead of it, um, is that they can also skate to where the puck is going. They can be and, and, and provide that opportunity to show some leadership as well in their community. So I think it's, it's presenting the opportunity to them and then connecting into those resources. So again, I was going to say by social, scale collaborative, collaborative, there's a few of us around that are definitely willing to help create that business case. Great, I'm just fiddling our mute button back and forth, sorry, I accidentally flipped that button. Um, as uh, I know that, oh, we have a question in here. I was gonna say, I know that your slides will be up and there was that great um, slide you had on doing an organizational assessment, so we'll definitely be sharing that. Uh, here is a question from uh, an asker on the call. Uh, can you comment on how, oh, there's an acronym here, uh-oh, uh, NWPTA restricts social procurement. Do you know what that acronym is? Or can the, can the asker? Uh, I don't know what that acronym is. I'm going to guess, I, I think it may be a trade agreement. Yeah. And I don't know so, what the WPA. So you have to read your trade agreement, um, but what we see is that there tends to be exemption for being able to direct funds towards community benefits. So we haven't seen that trade agreements have gotten in the way of other communities integrating social procurement. Well, that's very good news. Yeah. Okay. So we so have... I will... Yeah, sorry. Oh. oh, sorry. Here we go. New West Partnership Trade Agreement. Sorry. In our office, we have an acronym jar. So if you use an acronym, you have to stick a loony in the jar. <laughs> All right, you have a few more slides, don't you? Just two, and then we can open it up to questions. So as that ecosystem approach that I was talking about is we get social enterprises need capacity building. So they need support to, you know, understand their value system, build their skills, you know, help them launch, help them grow that whole capacity system that, that we know exists and, and is offered in many ways through Community Futures and through Small Business BC and Futurepreneur and all that. It's just thinking through, it, does that serve the whole spectrum of enterprises, whether they're nonprofit, charity, co-op, or for-profit entities? So that's the piece that needs to be looked at. We know that social finance needs investment opportunities, so it's connecting local investment opportunities to that, but also making sure that that pipeline or that, that system that's that supporting social enterprises also is green and, and making those maps around investment. And that social procurement is gonna need respondents that can measure their impact. So as we see this whole system of things, you can see how it begins to fit together. So my final slide is, you know, the world is changing, Let's change ahead of it and, and, and use these tools and these opportunities to, to be a part of the world that we're trying to create. So thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or you can give me a call. And if you have any final questions, you can also just ask them now. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm gonna do a couple of final announcements here. And then uh, if, if things come in and we're off the call, uh, they have come to us, we have them, we can answer them later by email. Um, so I just wanna say thank you very much to Christy for being our presenter. I'm just gonna show my, uh, my final few slides here. All right. Hopefully people can see that. Just waiting for it to kick in for you. Here we go. All right, upcoming webinars, yay. We have November 6th, uh, supporting business succession in your community. What can an economic development officer or a local government uh, officer do to um, help the businesses in your community make that transition into new ownership? And that is um, 
coming up November 6th and November 22nd, we are going to have a story showcase some of the recent stories from recent and a few upcoming stories, in fact, uh, from our BC Ideas Exchange story collection. Uh, I know I've just lined up the wonderful team from the Ukulet Chamber of Commerce. They're going to come and talk about their um, business retention and expansion program, which they have called the Ukulet uh, Business Expansion and Retention and Employment. So their acronym is Uber, which they get a pass on the acronym jar just for just for making that acronym. Uh, there's uh, more coming up, of course, um, so you can find that out at our website, um, which the short link is bit.ly slash webinars. I'm also going to be lining up our um, calendar for the, the spring. We're going to have some sessions on First Nations um, community planning, land, um, land management, taxation, because uh, having come from the local government environment myself, I know that I'm not informed enough about those areas to be able to be an effective partner in economic development for my neighboring First Nations. So um, learning, learning us up, leveling us up on our knowledge of the, uh, the First Nations and Indigenous economic development context. Uh, we're also going to be working on um, one or two uh, sessions, which will look at place marketing and place branding and uh, how those fit in with both disaster management and uh, just promoting your community as a place to come and visit. Um, if you want to find out about those and you're not already on our webinar list, this is the link. So just copy that down because unfortunately you can't click on my slides. Um, cm.pn slash 3inj and you won't miss an announcement. And um, after the webinar, um, it should pop up for you on your screen. But if you're busy and running somewhere, um, it'll come to you in an email in about an hour. So don't forget to register and we'll see you on the next webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Christy. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.